I said, I'm Michelle Murphy. I'm an associate professor of biology at Lake Regent State College. I'm also community faculty where I teach physiology in the Department of Physician Assistant Studies at the UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Uh, and I'm here with my co-presenter, Wei Hung, who uh, teaches educate in the uh, uh, educate department. They keep changing the names, but <laughs> education at UND. So he's gonna watch the chat for me because I can't see the chat while I'm sharing. Uh, the presentation. So he'll watch that and answer some questions on that as well. What we're going to look at today is we'll look at our research framework for the methods that we'll propose at the end here. We'll do some practice together uh, and, and interact at the end. But before we do that, we'll, we'll look at the research framework. We'll look at a brief overview of the studies that we've done, and then we'll do some practice. So how can we apply this in the classroom? And what I have used before is a tool called Google Jamboard. And I have taught predominantly online for the last 20 years. I've taught in the classroom, you know, sporadically, well, a lot, not sporadically, but I've been teaching for over 30 years. But most of what I teach now is either hybrid or online. Our, our physician assistant program at UND is a hybrid program. So we have, or actually blended would be a better description. Sometimes they're online, sometimes they're in person. And so using these technological tools is inclusive in that it allows everybody to participate. When we were uh, um, adapting our methods for COVID, we had some people in the classroom, but some people were still online. And that's actually what happened to me today. I was really looking forward to being there in person. COVID had other ideas and I had some exposures uh, last week. So we'll look at that process and then we'll play around with the tool so everybody can kind of see how it works. First, the research framework. In every field, there are threshold concepts. Those are essential to deep understanding in the field. And our previous presenter talked about the role of statistics and the role of R and understanding the economics. And it's the same thing in medicine and physiology. To understand and to go out and treat patients, you have to understand the physiology. How is this working? But a lot of students come into that with a very superficial understanding. They have maybe memorized to that point and they don't really deeply understand those foundational concepts. Student progress towards that deep understanding is guided by the mental model they have, the problem space. What schema are they drawing on to inform their movement from superficial to deep understanding. We, can, we say they mastered the threshold concepts when they can think both forwards and backwards throughout a functioning system. And the example I usually use is between memorization and understanding is think of the Pledge of Allegiance. If you can say the Pledge of Allegiance, you've memorized it. If you can jump in the Pledge of Allegiance in the middle and go backwards, then you really understand it. So if students can jump into a concept and work backwards, forwards, sideways, up, down, they really have it. And that's what we want them to have is that deep understanding so that when they move into their clinical studies and they're working at that level, they really understand what's going on with blood pressure, inflammation, all of these core concepts. This is based on systems theory. Physiological processes are nonlinear, dynamic, and complex, and that's not limited to physiology. Initial research in this was actually done in economics and the inputs and outputs to the system. And we use it in physiology because it applies so well. Thinking in systems supports deep conceptual understanding. So being able to move throughout this system and use it to support the framework of moving on in deeper clinical application um, concepts. Cognitive, cognitive tools help us because they help students represent their mental models as systems models. Systems modeling as a cognitive tool supports visualization of mental models a learner's using to support their understanding. I just worked last week with our brand new cohort of physician assistant students, and the biggest thing that I share with them and the biggest thing I want them to take away from that initial week is that I need to know where our starting point is. I need to be able to assess the gap of where your understanding is now and where I need you to be before we send you out into the clinic. 
To do that, I have to be able to evaluate their mental models. And in 30 years of teaching physiology and six years in the physician assistant program, last week, I realized that there was a component of their mental model, their mental schema that was pervasive that I had never recognized. And in identifying that, it helped me um, help them understand some of the concepts we were going through. I wouldn't be able to do that if they couldn't share their mental models with me. And then through systems modeling, I, they can share what their mental model looks like, and then I can see where any gaps are. If I just assume I know where they're starting and I just lecture at them and just tell them what I think they need to know and I don't take the time to evaluate where they're starting, then there's just a disconnect. So we need to understand together, the students and I, where we're starting from and how we're going to get to where we need to go. And cognitive tools help us do that. Systems modeling supports learning by providing a notation system where dynamic balancing or negative and reinforcing positive feedback loops may be visualized. As their complexity, as the model complexity increases, that demonstrates that their expertise has increases, increased. So systems modeling may be used to visualize student understanding and allow for evaluation and correction of misconceptions. I'm sorry, I'm stumbling over my words so much. I'm trying not to sneeze. I don't know if I have allergies or if it's the COVID exposures, but I figured, oops, to be safe, uh, I'd do this from Zoom. I'd really rather be there, though. But if we look at this process, so this is a systems model, and we're going to do some systems modeling together here in a little bit. What the systems model does is it takes the terms, and in that way, it's similar to, to concept mapping, but it's different in that we're linking the terms by directions, the arrows, and what these are called polarities. So when our metabolism goes up, that increases, stimulates an increase in blood carbon dioxide. And when our blood carbon dioxide goes up, that will inhibit metabolism. We'll have to shift our pathways if our blood ca uh, carbon dioxide goes up too much. If we hold our breath, that's going to increase our blood carbon dioxide. But if our blood carbon dioxide goes up, we can't hold our, our breath as much. We'll pass out and we'll start to breathe. So in this way, it allows us to take a whole bunch of words and put them into a visual representation that both the students and I can work together to uh, explore and see what misconceptions there are and to see if there are any, um, like I said, gaps that we need to address. Using those cognitive tools and the systems modeling can be a powerful way then of showing that mental model. We, we, I said earlier that to move from superficial learning to deep understanding, we need to assess the mental model. The mental model needs to gain complexity. In seeing that the mental model is accurate and complete and provides a good pathway or map for the student to increase their understanding, we can use systems modeling to evaluate that and visualize that. So I can see and the student can see their progress. This is based on the cognitive tool work by Jonathan and the systems thinking by uh, Weiss and Ver uh, Bertalanfi. And if you want these references, if there's anything that you're curious on, I can certainly provide them. Just email me and I can send you the reference list if there's any particular that you want to look at. So now where did we use this? We've done studies using systems modeling and uh, the impact that systems modeling has on student uh, achievement. The first study that we did was an undergraduate physiology course. This was pre-COVID, it was 2019. We had 119 or 111 students that agreed to participate in this study. There were students of mine at the undergraduate level. Uh, they demonstrated by improved test scores after systems modeling compared with a writing condition. And I won't get into all the details of the studies because they are it would take too much time because there are three different studies. But what we found is after they did systems modeling, their test scores did improve. It wasn't significant. The standard deviation was still too high. And part of that is probably because it is a new technique and it takes some cognitive load. We do plan on uh, doing this study for longer, for more units to see if that helps. But we did find this per performance gap with improved performance with the modeling condition on these test scores in the, the, not the first unit they did, it was actually the same, but over time, as they did this more, 
they did show an increase in performance in the modeling condition over the uh, written condition. As a new technique, like I said, it may take some time to overcome that initial cognitive load. So that gave us some encouragement that, okay, we're starting to see something here, but what do students think about this? Do they think it's helpful? So to do that, we did a, a survey study of, of graduate physician assistant physiology students where when they were out in clinic, they went back and they ranked what helped me best learn physiology when I was in the classroom or online. And what has helped me retain that knowledge now that I'm in the clinic? And we found that the top ranked, lowest numbers are better, the top ranked strategy for learning physiology in the classroom was consisting, uh, constructing these system diagram drawings. And it was the second to top ranked in the uh, clinical setting. It was um, superseded by explaining a concept to myself in my own words. These are the top five of the 15 strategies that students ranked. And looking at these strategies, they are predominantly active learning, things students do, not just reread, not just writing down things verbatim, things that help them. Now, you, a, a criticism of this could be, well, your research is in systems modeling. Of course, they're going to say that. But the thing is, the first cohort had not been exposed to that because the first cohort I taught a year before I started this research in systems, a year before I started my doctorate even, and they still ranked it number one. So even without any of that me putting bias at them, they still ranked it number one. There were no significant differences among the three cohorts in the strategies that they chose. So now we've got benefit demonstrated in undergraduate students. We've got graduate physiology students saying, yeah, we really think this is helpful. We did a third study to see how is it helpful. So in the third study, these again are graduate physiology students, different ones than did the survey. And we had them do systems modeling. And before they did it and after they did it, they wrote out some um, uh, question prompts. So they answered some question prompts about inflammation. And what they did before and after systems modeling is we found that their use of process terms over structure terms was uh, much higher. So if we look at, this is pre-instruction. So before they had instruction, it was actually during their orientation week in May. So we found that before they did systems modeling, they talked a lot about structures, cells, tissues, and not very much about processes like stress. And physiology, stress is a big component of inflammation, stress on the body and what the body does in response to that. This is still be after, after systems modeling, but before instruction. So these two time periods are only separated by about 30 minutes and one systems modeling activity. Yet, even after just that systems modeling activity, the uh, emphasis on words associated with structure went down, but the words associated with process went way up. And this was group modeling. This was not whole group modeling. This was small group modeling. This was not a whole group think of the class. Okay, now we're all going to write about stress. This was independent groups coming up with this process just based on systems modeling. Now, it looks like that had a reverse after instruction, but this is where it's important to really look at what they said, because this actually does not indicate a reverse of the prior. It indicates that they now are talking more about individual processes because they've had the instruction. So they talk about cells communicate by this. To look at that distinction, we really need to look at what they said. And looking back at this first study again, Oops, I hit my pen, so hopefully that doesn't mess that up. They talk about stress after systems modeling. They talk about stress as a process, constant state of stress. The, the cell is under some type of stress, process. Stress, this was more of a noun, but process. The um, internal stressors, so components of the condition. So we really can look at this word frequency, which was done in R uh, through text mining based on their responses. I didn't sit and count those all up. R does that for you. And then go and qualitatively look more at their, actually what they said. So the three studies all together then 
show us that the undergraduate students did find some testing benefit from systems modeling. The graduate students thought it was the most beneficial technique for learning physiology, even when they hadn't been taught it specifically. And then the graduate students later, more recent cohorts of graduate students demonstrated that they increased their process thinking over their structure thinking based on systems modeling. So how do we do systems modeling? This is great, it's, it works, it's wonderful, but how do we do it? How can we help this, whatever subject you teach, we can use this. So we're going to create a systems model together. We'll see how it works. This is an example of what I do in the classroom when I have students with me, we do it on the whiteboard or we do it on paper. And this is what a systems model looks like. It's all the components coming into this system and how they either stimulate or inhibit the process. So when we build one together, we're going to use Google Jamboards. So if you would go to Google Jamboards, you can do it on your phone. You can do it if you're online on a computer. Um, it's not gonna let me make my pen smaller, but that's okay. We're going to start with blood pressure. And what are, and this is the way I do it. I'll show you how I, I work through this with my students. And this can be adapted to any subject. Normally what I have them do is type in the chat, but if you are on the, the Jamboard, if you wanna just write in maybe like the corners, like whatever you think contributes to blood pressure. So we'll not make the diagram yet, but write it in the corners or put it in the chat. What's something that contributes to blood pressure? And see, a lot of people can be working at the same time and we can use these and, and I'll, we'll, we'll get some on there and then we'll make a model out of them here. All right, those are good. We can start with those, but keep adding though. Yeah, diet, good, weight, stress, absolutely, absolutely. I'm a physiologist, so I'm gonna start with these sodium levels here, which actually my master's research, your sodium levels, I'll, I'll go against medical wisdom here, matter the most if your kidneys are bad. Otherwise your kidneys will deal with the sodium. But let's look at sodium here. So we know that sodium, as sodium goes up, that can stimulate blood pressure, that can increase blood pressure. So in just that little bit of a relationship, we can impact uh, a systems model, we can make a systems model. Now, when I'm going through this with students, and I'll get to the other ones that we've got on here too. When I get to this with students, and I have them do that, then we can use it as a teachable moment. And I can say, okay, now your blood pressure's up, you have a hormone that will help you release some of that sodium. So if your blood pressure goes up, you'll use a hormone. And that hormone is called atrial natriuretic peptide. So if I'm teaching, I'll say, okay, now we, you said that your sodium levels going up can impact blood pressure. So now we have a hormone that we can use and that can decrease our sodium level because it'll help us get rid of it in the urine. Health of the arteries, absolutely. So health of the arteries, the more um, stenotic the arteries are, the more the blood pressure is going to be. So health of the arteries, arteries, we can say uh, if they're stiff, if they're stenotic, then that will increase blood pressure. Diet and weight, both diet and weight. Now diet can go either way because diet can also be healthy or it can be unhealthy. So let's go with, with weight. As weight goes up, weight increases body mass, which increases our um, necessity for impacting our uh, a blood, our body volume. And so where did I put body mass and that can also impact the health of our arteries that can make those worse. And then body mass that way through that impact of the health of the arteries can increase blood pressure. Um, sitting standing absolutely can impact blood pressure and sitting standing. The thing that sitting standing does, it's similar to health of the arteries but it impacts your veins. So how, how healthy are the veins and how well can they get those, that blood back to the heart? That will impact blood pressure. So we can look at not just health of the arteries, but health of the veins. Um, stress, yes, sugar, absolutely. And the big thing about sugar is it generates what are called reactive um, uh, advanced glycation end products. And so what sugar actually does is it inhibits the health of your arteries. 
And so it makes your arteries less uh, flexible, less pliable. And in doing that, it impacts the health of your arteries. So now we can see that we have that. Now it looks like, okay, this is a big, messy thing. Nobody's going to be able to, to comprehend this. This is craziness. But the thing I like about Google Jamboards is I can make a new page up here at the top and move on to a blank sheet without having to erase it. I can still keep that. And so we can build iterative versions of systems models. And I can go in and I could say, okay, what we looked at now is blood pressure. And one of the things that we determined was really an important component of blood pressure is health of the arteries. And we saw that health of the arteries impacts blood pressure. And what determines health of the arteries are things like um, the stiffness or arteriosclerosis. That impairs the health of the arteries. Atherosclerosis, we didn't talk about that one, but that comes into diet. And I'll bring that component in here too. Atherosclerosis, which is fat buildup in the arteries and that impairs the health of the arteries. Atherosclerosis is primarily a factor of diet. There's genetics also, but diet can uh, increase the incidence of atherosclerosis, especially if there is high cholesterol. So cholesterol may be a mediating factor in this. We mentioned sodium. If sodium increases, that can increase blood pressure because water will follow sodium and that increases the blood volume. But we have hormones that can inhibit that sodium like atrial natriuretic peptide. So what we did together using Google Jamboards with people that are in the room like some of you are and online like some of you are in a hybrid environment, we can work together to build these models and move through different versions using, I, I really like Google Jamboards for this property that I can draw, but I can also make as many slides on this as I want. So I don't lose any information. I don't have to erase the whiteboard, which is a common problem with Zoom and Blackboard Collaborate. You have to erase your whiteboard and we can build together iterative versions that students can use then to assess their understanding and their mental model. And it can um, provide them a tool to visualize where they are and that they and I can work together to see what the gap is from where they're starting to where we need them to be before they go out into the clinic. So this, I wanted to share this tool because my students have found it so valuable and I have found it valuable as well. All right, we have a few minutes left. Are there any questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, on the, the earlier example about uh, students changing the way that they're thinking going to, due to the discussion or the, the engagement, um, what are the findings in terms of, of impacts long-term or at least sustaining impacts long-term? For systems modeling, most, is that what you're asking for systems yeah, modeling? For the change in their own mental model. Oh, okay. For the um, mental model changes, a lot of that work is in uh, misconception and conceptual change. And a lot of that work has, has been done in elementary students uh, with conservation of, of variables where they just change one variable. So there actually is not a lot of long-term work at the, even the undergraduate level, it's mostly been done in children, which is one of the reasons I like to look at this to get some of that literature out there to build that up a little bit, because I'd love to know those, those um, mental model kind of findings, but there isn't a lot out there yet. Systems modeling as a process is, is a, is in some ways a new, in some ways an old process. It was first developed and proposed back, uh, it had some time in the 70s, then in the 90s with, with Jonathan's cognitive tools, but the really the increase in technology has really kind of given it that push recently.
I have a quick question in your uh, title. Uh, you mentioned threshold concept. Mental yes. Model. Uh, how do you define these thresholds? I mean, I, there is tre- is this about threshold concepts as a you know field of study, or it's a threshold that you define you know as part of your research? Absolutely, that's an excellent question. This threshold concepts is an area where there has been research in my field of physiology. They're actually called core concepts. And the core concepts are those, there's been work, um, a lot of work by um, Michael and McFarlane in trying to identify what actually do we mean by core concepts. They've asked students, they've done faculty surveys, they've done um, uh, interviews to see what is holding up students. Where are these core concepts? What are the bottlenecks? And one of the things that we're looking at researching is assessing in students, where are the bottlenecks? So in each field, the definition of threshold concepts is going to be a little different. The basic definition is what is necessary in your field that students have to understand before they can move forward. Uh, the threshold concepts as defined by Land and Meyer are just that kind of vague. What is in your field that needs to be understood? Once you get out into the fields, then each field is working on defining what are those core threshold concepts in our field. And that's still, Land and Meyer's work was 2005 and then more recently in 1415, they put out some work on that. And so it's relatively recent and not really a consensus built for every subject, this is what our core concepts are. In physiology, we have the core concepts established, but in other fields, there is still work being done on that. But that's a great question. Michelle, there is yes. one question from the chat. Do you use this in small group or individual work as well? If so, could you give some examples? Absolutely. Mostly I do it in groups. Uh, For example, last week I had my new cohort doing, um, they worked in a small group of four or five and they did it on a paper. And then what I had them do after a, a few minutes, like 10 minutes, is I had them share it their paper with the group next to them and explain what they had, their model was on inflammation, what they had with the group next to them. Then after they did that, I had each original group go up to the board. I had written inflammation and they added two things to the total picture. And then they built on each others. So I do it primarily as group work. I have done it as individual work, but not to start because they they aren't comfortable with the notation process. So I do a bunch of group work with them first. When I do it in class, I do it the way we just did it together. I have them mostly put in the chat what contributes to blood pressure, and then we build a model. So mostly group work. This is one of those areas where group work can work to your benefit to decrease their cognitive load. So they can help each other out here. It would be very cognitively demanding to, for them to start out individually. Yeah, Michelle, I don't know if you can see. Um, um, there's uh, one person raised her hand. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, hi. Um, hi. Uh, this is Chi. I have a question. Um, I'm just wondering if your your this teaching technique has been shared with. Uh, if there's anybody else like in your group um, that using it, I'm just wondering if it's like without practice in other classes, it's become like a, just a requirement from your particular class rather than like a long-term um, learning improvement from the students. Absolutely. Not yet. Um, I just, we haven't published this yet. I just finished my dissertation in May. And so these, these three studies are actually all out for consideration. But um, I actually am going to work with the, have been invited to present at an active learning series that the medical school has over uh, the course they do workshops. I've been invited to present there <coughs> this coming school year. So we're going to uh, do that and hopefully increase the use of it. In, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Thank you.